this assembly will come to order. Hamilton College recognizes our collective responsibility to acknowledge our colonial history. Our campus is located on the ancestral and traditional lands of the Oneida Nation. We express gratitude for the relationship between Chief Scanandoa and Samuel Kirkland, who founded the Hamilton Oneida Academy to educate Indigenous and settler youth together. That institution became Hamilton College. Today, the Hamilton College community commits itself to engaging in solidarity with the Oneida Nation and to ensuring that the perspectives and cultures of Indigenous peoples are honored and embraced. In this season of disruption, where we no longer continue in the old way, may we be granted the resolve and the courage to pursue a new way. We confess our collective tendency to lift, lift up our own excellence and self-goodness rather than face the work we know is both crucial and difficult and waiting for us to build a community of trust on this hill where there might no longer exist two types of people, those who feel this is their alma mater, their college, and those who feel somewhat like a visitor, an interloper passing through. Pour out your abundance of wisdom and justice upon us, we pray. O oh, essence of what is true, that we might be equipped to prioritize our most precious educational mission, to teach and to learn in our classrooms and in our residence and dining halls, in our working and in our social lives, to teach and to learn the intentional focus and sustained energy required to become a community together to teach and to learn from each other that anyone who feels left out is a problem for all of us, that anyone who lacks a sense of belonging here is something for us all to lament and address, that all differences between us offer us a deeper togetherness. This is the gift May we have the wisdom to offer it to each other here and to our world when we graduate. And as you begin your journey here, class of 2024, you who have felt the disruption of this season as much as anyone, our prayer is that you will be strengthened in what you experience and learn here <clears throat> starting tomorrow and that you will also help guide the way your college walks forward. Not trying to fit yourselves into what used to be Hamilton, but disrupt the old path and set us on a new journey, committed with our first energies and freshest thoughts to create together a community of trust, not in name only, but in the lived experience of mutual understanding and value across our many differences. Amen. Welcome everyone. I'm David Whitman, the president of Hamilton College, and a special welcome to the class of 2024. You've endured a great deal to get here, and we're happy you have gotten here, or at any rate, we're happy you're on campus, even if we can't share this moment together in person. It was no small task to prepare for your arrival, just it was as it was no small task for you to get here. 12 years of academic preparation, and just when you thought you were done with your last college entrance exam, we sent you another test in the mail, this time a COVID-19 test. At least you don't have to study for those. For those of you who may have tested positive for COVID-19, we hope that your symptoms are mild or non-existent, that you're on your way to Clinton soon, we look forward to having you join us. The last six months have brought challenges that none of us could have anticipated. The COVID pandemic has destroyed countless lives and livelihoods and continues to ravage communities around the world. 
With that in mind, I want to offer a word of support and encouragement to the members of the Hamilton community whose families may have been directly affected by this terrible virus. Please take care of yourselves and your loved ones. Now, starting college is never easy, but starting during a pandemic, well, that takes both courage and confidence. Courage to pursue your goals in the face of daunting obstacles and confidence in yourself and your community. Confidence that you can adapt to changing circumstances and succeed in the face of the unexpected. Ironically, many have accused your generation of lacking courage and confidence. Indeed, Gen Z is often stereotyped as entitled and overly sensitive, in a word, as snowflakes. But where have those critics been these past six months? I believe the strength, flexibility, persistence, and resilience that you have demonstrated in navigating this pandemic will come to define your generation. Together, we will get through this pandemic, and with luck, we'll do it soon. As a country, we've weathered past pandemics. We know what's required. And even if we don't always act as we should, work on vaccines, testing, and treatments is moving quickly. But there are other challenges your generation must face, challenges that will also require courage and confidence, and that will take far longer to resolve than the pandemic. In particular, I am hopeful that your generation can help this country and the world confront and dismantle systemic racism, one of society's most pernicious and destructive evils. After 400 years, I know it's a lot to ask of those just starting out. But even though it's a trite thing to say, you are the future. Most of you were born in the early years of the new century, just after the attacks on 9-11. You've already lived through a great recession, the start of a global pandemic, and the beginning of a worldwide movement to confront systemic racism. Of course, yours is not the first generation to confront enormous challenges. 100 years ago, a different generation encountered a worldwide pandemic in their teens, then faced a world war, a Great Depression, and a second world war. Every generation faces its own challenges and confronts its own defining moments. As I told the members of the graduating class this past spring, we don't get to choose our defining moments, they choose us. As the Irish author Darren O'Shaughnessy observed, we just have to stand and face them when they come, no matter what sort of a state we're in. Doubtless, the coronavirus pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement will be defining moments for your generation. But while we may not get to choose our defining moments, we do get to choose how to respond. Inevitably, adversity brings with it disappointment, anxiety, and loss. But it also brings opportunity to learn, to grow, to find your own inner strength. And if you accept that premise, I see no limit to what you can achieve. What do we really know about your generation, though, about you? In some ways, quite a lot. In others, hardly anything. We know some facts. We know some statistics. We know, for example, that your generation comprises about 25% of the country's population, that you spend an enormous amount of time in an online world that scarcely existed when your parents were growing up. By some estimates, you spend as much as nine hours a day on social media, YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, and the like. We know you are the most diverse generation in American history, that you live in an always-on culture, that you have higher levels of anxiety than past generations, that most of you care deeply about issues of social justice. And as hard as campus safety may find this to believe, that your generation's drinking, smoking, and drug use have all declined. Of course, we also know there's huge variation within your generation, just as there is within every generation. As commentator Jeff Salingo noted in a report on the new generation of students published a year ago in the Chronicle of Higher Education, yours is a diverse generation that grew up in an era of school shootings, the Great Recession, the Occupy Movement, protests over police brutality, and the legalization of gay marriage. All of it streamed on their, which is to say your, devices, and followed through hashtags on social media, making today's students worried about money, anxious about the future, and more inclusive of differences in identity. 
These experiences help explain some of the debates and controversies that arise on college campuses. And those controversies, in turn, help shape the broader society's view of higher education. What the educational technology company EAB calls climate flashpoints, campus controversies on issues ranging from bias-related speech to sexual misconduct to controversy about speakers invited to campus, arise in part because your experiences predispose you to views that may differ in important respects from those of prior generations. At the same time, campus controversies capture public attention, in part because shifts in social norms are often visible first on college campuses. As Salingo put it in the report I mentioned, colleges have long been on the frontier of generational change. Before workplaces and the rest of society encounter the shifting attitudes of new cohorts, this evolution unfolds first on college campuses where large segments of the population make the transition from adolescence to adulthood. We begin this semester at a time of monumental disruption and on the eve of what may be one of the most consequential elections in American history. Rather than lamenting the turmoil, I hope you will embrace the opportunity to help shape the future. There may not be much you can do about the coronavirus pandemic worldwide, but you can demonstrate your concern for others by following the guidelines we have established to help keep all of us safe. Yes, those restrictions will be difficult and unfamiliar, but they're an opportunity for all of us. And while there are limits to what you can do to confront global racism, you can join in the work of fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion here at Hamilton. We're working hard to develop and implement a new equity and inclusion plan. We've made some progress but there's a lot more to do. The process both, at he both here at Hamilton and more broadly will be difficult, but the rewards profound. Four years from now, when we gather at your commencement, I hope you heed the advice of the television journalist and author Tom Brokaw, who's coined, who cr was credited with coining the term the greatest generation to describe those who survived the Great Depression and won World War II. You are educated, Brokaw said. Your certification is in your degree. You may think of it as the ticket to the good life. Let me ask you to think of an alternative. Think of it as your ticket to change the world. Over the next four years, we will give you the best education we can to prepare you for lives of meaning, purpose, and active citizenship. So when the time comes to gather for your 20th or your 30th, or perhaps your 50th reunion, maybe, just maybe, the term greatest generation will have a new meaning. Welcome to Hamilton. Immediately following this ceremony, you will sign and submit honor cards, indicating your positive assent to Hamilton's honor code and your intention to uphold our shared principles of honesty and truthfulness. As a member of the faculty and their dean, I serve in this ceremony as the representative of academic integrity that stands as a central ideal of Hamilton College. Though it is ceremonial, and in this case digital, this rite is not an empty gesture. It marks with meaning your entrance into a community of trust. You enter into your Hamilton College education so that you may know yourself, be who you are, and find your future. These promises are actually tasks that you will undertake over the next four years. At Hamilton, you will demonstrate by your words and deeds whether our cherished virtues of honesty, inclusiveness, mutual respect, and thoughtfulness will be animated through your actions into something more than a parade of attractive abstractions that we bring out for ceremonial occasions. If, as I hope, you choose to live the virtues associated with a liberally educated person, I trust that you will discover for yourselves what Aristotle tells us about virtues as a general category. The philosopher reminds us that virtues are not simply a matter of personal attainment, lovely adjectives to be described by. He describes virtue and justice as versions of the same phenomenon, two sides of the same coin. Considered in relation to somebody else, Aristotle writes, is justice, 
when considered simply as a kind of moral state, is virtue. That is, when we put our virtues into action through our words and deeds, we arrive inevitably at justice. So how does this work? It starts with spoken words and it relies on our individual integrity. Every time we speak, we enact in a simply daily practice our respect for others, for all others. The path from this to justice is not difficult to follow. Simply giving your attention to others involves you in habits of responsibility and recognition that broaden your world as they tether you more tightly to a known community, the context in which you will win the esteem of both faculty and new friends. We do this work with our words. From the day we are born, we live inside a medium of language. By the time we are 24 months old, most of us are engaged in shaping our reality with the words we speak. So it matters which words we choose when we describe ourselves and our aspirations, when we greet or characterize others, when we say who we are and where we want to go. Once we have learned to read, we cannot give up our literacy. Our creation myths and our senses of self both begin with words or even the word logos. Those of you with some Greek will know that although we conventionally translate it as word, logos also means saying, speech, discourse, thought, proportion, ratio, account, and reason, practically a map of the traditional liberal arts. We do not often step outside the reach of logos. Our words are deeds. The faculty will ask many things of you, and the very first one is a deed committed by signing your name. By pledging your word of honor with your signature, you have joined a community of trust. I will receive these pledges on behalf of a faculty who are guided by similar professional codes of conduct in their teaching and their scholarship, research, and creative lives. The most visible sign of our commitment to academic integrity is citation in a citation style, those systems called Chicago style, APA, MLA style, or Turabian. You will learn to use more than one of these styles with facility. And here's a pro tip, ask your faculty member which citation style to use if it isn't specified in a writing assignment. All subjects taught here require original work, so you won't plagiarize. Using citation properly not only announces to your reader behold this honest work, but it does something more generous, something that extends beyond a badge of honor worn by an individual of integrity. Citation shows the next reader where to find what you found. It is a form of sharing, the fundamental virtue of living in a community. For academic integrity means not only documenting your sources, it also means opening yourself up to others' differing interpretations of your sources. It says, I am willing to hear your alternative view on the matter. I am willing to show you why I have come to my conclusions. Let's compare our evidence. In a community of integrity, it does not harm our own points of view and positions to entertain alternatives. We know that we do not make false claims ourselves, and we believe that others adhere to the same high standard. Of course, we warn each other when fake news goes viral. There are statements that we must denounce for their malicious intentions. But in the regular give and take of discussion, exploration, interpretation of results, of discovery, our individual pledges of integrity draw a proud line around our boundaries. Hamilton College is an honest place. They also mark out a zone where we can create common good. Out of differences come understanding, not capitulation to a prefab set of right answers. Your pledge of academic integrity marks your commitment to a community where our distinctions and differences, our identities and perspectives become our shared resources. Joining this community symbolically located on a hill placed here in the first generation of our nation's founding reminds us that Americans have frequently seen themselves as exceptional and separate, bound together by oaths and pledges that exclude a world that disagrees with them. This is not our way. We cherish our freedoms of speech and press. We rely on integrity and care to govern and curb our language. 
once we recall that we have committed ourselves to principles of inclusiveness and respect for others, it should be clear that community standards are violated if and when words bring harm. But we take on the responsibility of meeting unacceptable speech with more speech, rather than prohibiting the expression of ideas that we find threatening. During the course of your education, you will be exposed to ideas that you dislike, and we won't try to shelter you from those challenges. Indeed, when Hamilton College was young, the new nation had just committed itself to a free press, to free speech, and to freedom of assembly. The founders placed their trust in arguments and demonstrations. They gave up the ideas of separatism and religious tests that had drawn many of their great grandparents to this continent. American democracy was far from perfect then, and it is far from perfect now. But it is constructed to sustain itself through the arguments of the people. As a result of those disputes, today we draw the lines of community much more inclusively than the founders could have imagined as we attempt to understand and repair the damage of exclusion. We say Black Lives Matter. At Hamilton College, all are invited to participate in argument and contestation in the testing of alternatives in conversation and experiment that are the warp and weft of our democracy. We have come a long way from your honor pledge, indicating your intention to do original and honest work. By completing that task, you begin internalizing a sense of personal integrity as a permanent aspect of your character. By accepting your promises, I welcome you into a community where together we will challenge one another, care about one another, and as the foundation for the work we do together, hold one another to the high standards of mutual trust. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I want to extend a warm welcome to the class of 2024 and new transfer students. At the end of convocation, you'll be prompted on Blackboard to read and sign the Honor Code Pledge, signaling the start of your time at Hamilton. The Honor Code has guided students through their academic endeavors for over 100 years, and as circumstances change, and as Hamilton changes, the Honor Code remains steadfast as a principle that students aspire to embody and fulfill. The Honor Code Pledge is a promise. When you sign the pledge, you are promising to uphold the highest standards of honesty and integrity. The pledge is also a promise to your peers. It lays down a bedrock of trust that defines and strengthens our community. The pledge is a promise to Hamilton that in return will unlock the best of what a liberal arts education has to offer. At Hamilton, you will encounter outstanding professors, peers, and community members. You'll have the opportunity to chase your passions. You'll be asked to think critically, and you'll be challenged in ways unimaginable. My hope is that upon graduation, you'll reflect back at a rich, multifaceted, and rewarding experience. You're embarking on a remarkable chapter of your life at a remarkable time in history. When you sign the Honor Code Pledge, I want you to reflect on the values that the Honor Code represents and how they will guide your decisions. Thank you. President Whitman, Dean King, distinguished faculty and fellow colleagues, welcome again to the newest members of our student body and to those who are returning, I send you warm greetings. I'm so glad you're all back on campus and hope those of you who are at home are doing well. We will miss your presence on campus this semester, and I look forward to you returning sometime in the near future. We've been focusing so much on COVID planning this summer, I can't wait to have conversations with students about other things. Today marks the beginning of a new year in an ever-changing campus community and national landscape. As you go about your daily interactions and pursue your learning, I ask that you consider your part in making this campus, our campus, a healthy and safe one, and one that is welcoming to all. One that faces a great challenge unlike ever before, that only you can help address. We are all in a unique and fortunate position of being in a community which we get to shape. Whether it's in the classroom or in your residential community, how you show up 
defines the experience for yourself and for others. Now more than ever, I call upon each of you to bring your best self to campus, to think about this place as something precious that needs your very close attention. Our success depends on your actions and you get to determine our fate. We've worked hard all summer and now it's time for you to do some hard work. That is to think about how your behaviors impact the community in some very real ways. Together, we need to create this new reality and we can change the conversation from one that focuses on challenges to one that focuses on opportunities. Creatively, we can look at one of the most important aspects of the college experience, relationships. How do we cultivate them and sustain them in a new socially distant reality? I invite you to join me in facing this challenge. Let's explore this together. Send your thoughts and let's meet to figure it out. How you show up here matters now more than ever and there are countless opportunities for you to engage in real ways this semester to solve some of our biggest issues, health, safety, racism, classism, the list goes on and I hope you'll make space to contribute to the discussions and to the work. Take the opportunity to commit and to engage. Along the way, don't forget to take care of yourself. The most basic things you may have learned along the way matter. You've heard me say this before, sleep. Sleep for at least seven to eight hours consistently and don't fall into the lack of sleep Olympics. If someone tells you they only slept for three hours, don't compete. Physically move for 40 minutes a day, ask a friend to join you for a walk, but don't forget to wear your mask and stay safely distant. Join in the many virtual exercise classes we offer. Reflect on what you've accomplished each day and prepare for the day ahead. Before you go to bed each night, think about what you've done that day or what you're most grateful for. Reach out to others to talk through a challenge you are facing. Each of these things allows you to be responsible for your own well-being and ultimately to do well in your coursework, to engage in healthy relationships, and to make better decisions. Ultimately, you're responsible for yourself and this community and you can help create the best experience for yourself and for others. And I hope you take that seriously. So to each of you, I wish you a great year and a safe semester ahead. I look forward to connecting with you. It is my pleasure to recognize this year's student award winners. I would like to begin by recognizing the recipients of the prize scholarships. The Benjamin Walworth Arnold Prize Scholarship goes to Summer Sheng, James Argo, and Brendan McGill. The Robert A. Bankert Jr. Prize Scholarship, Johnny Hill. The Captain Gerald Fitzgerald Dale Senior Scholarship, Justin Philiber. The Charles A. Dana Prize Scholarship goes to Alexander Oger. Tyler Meshkinyar, Natalie Martinez, Gabriana Rosario Guerrero, Lauren Nice, Alexandra Seewald, Max Gersh, Aidan Holmgren, and Nicholas Hawkins. The Dual German Prize Scholarship, Theodore Simpson. The Donald A. Hamilton Prize Scholarship, Joel Adade, the Ann Miller Hardin Prize Scholarship, Satchel McLaughlin, the Matthew Houlihan Prize Scholarship, Riley Nichols, the Edward Huntington Memorial Mathematical Prize Scholarship, to Alexandra Golub, Aurora Kai, the Grant 21 and Silas 52 Keen Prize Scholarship, Max Gersh and Aidan Holmgren. 
the Willard Bostwick Marsh Prize Scholarship, Duck Pham Sana Salimi, the Marcel Morad Memorial Prize Scholarship, Ellen Chinchilli, the Oren Root Prize Scholarship, Joseph Kosamar, Taryn Kui, and Hannah Reck. The Arthur W. Soper Prize Scholarship in Latin, Francesca Parson. The Chauncey S. Truex Prize Scholarship in Greek, Julia Stevens. The Vrooman Prize Scholarship, Philip Shavili. The Lawrence Yorty Prize Scholarship, Sambat Bandari. The Brockway Prize, Brendan McGill. The Class of 1990 Scholarship, Juan Guerra and Anthony Thompson. Congratulations to our prize scholarship winners. Now I'd like to recognize the winners of the achievement prizes. CRC Press First Year Prize in Chemistry to Xander Harpel and Allison Reed. The Dr. Edward Fitch Prize in Greek, Jeffrey Martinez. The Edward Fitch Prize in Latin, Casey Brown. The Leo Makta Prize in Physics, Lindsay Gerty and Eileen Wilcox. The Phi Beta Kappa Book Prize goes to Sosana Abuhai, George Brady, Anna Edelson, Max Gersh, Clara Harding, Zanda Harpel, Brendan McGill, Natalie Martinez, Andy Mechanic, Yu Yang Meng, Trevor Schwang, Hazel Schrader, Sarah Shedroff, Laura Spear, Meryl Storch, Annika Tullos, Clara Walling, and Maeve Zimmerman. The Rusty Smith Memorial Teaching Prize in Computer Science, Jack Skako. The Linda Aqua Strobel Memorial Teaching Prize in Mathematics, Sarah Downey. The Winslow Prize in Greek, Aidan Holmgren. The Winslow Prize in Latin, Natalie Martinez. The Winslow Prize in Romance Languages for French, Abigail Henkel. The Winslow Prize in Romance Languages for Hispanic Studies, Gregory Varney and Sarah Bargamian. The Hutton Essay Prize, Genesis Alvarez. Congratulations to the winners of our achievement prizes. Now I'd like to acknowledge our writing prize recipients. The Dwight N. Lindley Prize goes to Hannah Turau and Annika Enzian. The Alfred J. and A. Barrett Seaman Prizes in Writing go to Catherine Biederman, Joseph Hahn, Brooke Kessler, and Hannah Peterson. Congratulations to all of our deserving prize recipients.
this assembly is adjourned.